Welcome. My name is Simon Radford. I'm the director of Hawaii operations for the submillimeter array. I'll be talking about the effects of the Earth's atmosphere on submillimeter astronomy. Here's a picture of the atmosphere from space, from orbit, and it's that nice thin blue layer of gases that surrounds the Earth and what gets between us and the celestial objects that we want to observe. There are two primary effects on submillimeter observations. The atmosphere is only partially transparent. It's also turbulent. And I'll discuss these two effects separately. Much of this material is covered in Thompson, Moran, and Swenson's book, chapter 13. This is a spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum showing the absorption or the transparency of the atmosphere across the spectrum. There's a large window at long wavelengths for radio waves can propagate through the atmosphere. In the visible wavelength, we can see out into space, as we all know. But in most other wavelengths, the atmosphere blocks incoming radiation. Uh, at high, at short wavelengths, high energy radiation is blocked by the ozone layer. Um, at very high energy radiation, gamma rays can collide with atmospheric particles, atmospheric molecules, and cause air showers that are detectable um, with air shower telescopes. In the far infrared and some millimeter water vapor, atmospheric water vapor absorbs most of the radiation. And so the atmosphere is only partially transparent. This depends on the amount of water vapor and generally higher, drier sites are more feasible for some millimeter observations. Let me start by saying that the submillimeter sky is bright. Unlike in the optical, where we have bright stars against the dark sky, in the submillimeter, the sky is always bright. Uh, this is the formula for calculating the equivalent sky temperature, brightness temperature. And for reasonable um, values of the parameters, the sky temperature at 230 gigahertz is about 30 degrees Kelvin, which is comparable to the receiver temperature in the SMA. Uh, this means that we're, when we look at sources, we're looking at very low contrast sources. As an example, I've worked out, if you look at a Uranus, which has a brightness temperature of maybe 100 degrees and a size of maybe three, four arc seconds, with one of the SMA antennas, which has a 55 arc second beam, then the contrast is only about 1% of the sky brightness. Uh, and that means whenever we observe uh, in some millimeter astronomy, we're doing some differential techniques. We're using differential techniques to subtract the brightness of the sky in one hand and the brightness of the sky plus our target in another hand. That either means switching back and forth between two patches nearby on the sky or some other technique such as interferometry that implicitly is a differential technique. The atmosphere, the layer we're worried about is the troposphere. Uh, the atmosphere throughout is made primarily of nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, molecular oxygen, some argon and carbon dioxide are the main gases. All these are well mixed and have a scale height of about eight kilometers. Um, the temperature, except for inversion layers, decreases about six and a half Kelvin per kilometer. So we, as you go up, it gets colder, Warm air near the surface generally rises uh, as it cools off until it reaches equilibrium. Inversion layers can trap uh, air because in an inversion layer, the temperature starts rising with altitude instead of decreasing. And that can trap gases below the inversion layer because warm gases are no longer buoyant. Water vapor, is a very important constituent for submillimeter astronomy because it um, 
it absorbs cosmic radiation very efficiently in the submillimeter and far infrared, but it's, ve it's, um, it's variable. It's variable. Its concentration is variable and it has a much smaller scale height than the rest of the atmosphere, generally one to two kilometer scale height. This is an image, a map of the distribution of atmospheric water vapor on the Earth. And you see the dark red is high water vapor, and the dark purple is low water vapor. The units are millimeters of equivalent water vapor. This is the amount of water vapor you would, um, if you precipitated the entire column of atmospheric water vapor, how deep would be the liquid that you precipitated out of that column. Generally for submillimeter astronomy, we're interested in sites where there's two millimeters or less of water vapor much of the time. And I've marked three prime sites for submillimeter astronomy, Mauna Kea on the island of Kauai in the Pacific, uh, Shanantor area in the Atacama Desert in the high Andes of Northern Chile, and the South Pole in Antarctica. There are other possibilities, including Greenland, uh, that are being uh, explored and developed. But the three sites I've marked are the primary sites of, of current submillimeter astronomy telescopes. Here's a picture of Mauna Kea with all the telescopes on most of them optical. But the submillimeter array on the right hand side, you can see the antennas. This picture was taken at sunset and has a, shows a very nice shadow of the mountain extending off to the east. I'd also like to point out the clouds here are below the summit. And this is an effect of the inversion layer. The temperature starts increasing above the layer of the clouds. The clouds can no are no longer buoyant if they try and cross the, if they try and rise above the inversion layer. And so they're trapped below the inversion layer and that traps most of the moisture below the summit of Mauna Kea. Uh, generally, Mauna Kea, the summit is above 90% of the water vapor that you would otherwise find at sea level. This is a energy diagram of the rotational transitions, the rotational energy states and transitions of water. Water comes in two varieties, water vapor, depending on the spin of the hydrogen atoms um, that make up uh, water with the oxygen. And this is the first few energy levels with all of the transitions, allowed transitions marked with their frequency in gigahertz. Uh, this, these are very low lying transitions. The excitation temperature on the left shows these um, transitions have excitation temperatures of a few, a couple of hundred degrees at most. And so they're very heavily populated under normal conditions. In addition, the atmosphere is thick uh, compared with astronomical um, gas conditions. So these lines are extremely broadened by pressure in the atmosphere. These lines are all in the submillimeter and they form, they absorb very strongly at these frequencies and nearby frequencies. This shows a model of the atmosphere above Mauna Kea uh, under different conditions of water vapor, the red line is two millimeters of water vapor. That's roughly the median condition. One millimeter of water vapor is about the first quartile. And the very best conditions are perhaps 200 micrometers of water vapor. The blue arrows point to many of the water vapor transitions I showed in that energy diagram. And you can see the deep absorption features at those transitions. This divides the submillimeter spectrum into a number of 
semi-transparent windows where we can observe. And on the bottom, I show the frequency range of the SMA from roughly 200 to 450 gigahertz. And then the frequency bands for ALMA in purple, which extend up into the 850 gigahertz window. This shows the crucial importance of dry conditions for high frequency observing. The transmission varies tremendously, especially in the very high frequency windows, uh, uh, 650 and 850 gigahertz, uh, depending on the amount of water. A measurement technique for determining the optical depth of the atmosphere is a sky tipper. Uh, this technique was developed by Bob Dickey in the 1940s. You take a radiometer and you move the radiometer so it points at the zenith and then points at different zenith angles down to the horizon. And then you go back up to the zenith and repeat. And at each zenith angle, you measure the sky brightness temperature. Then you can use the formula we had earlier to determine the optical depth of this atmosphere and the effective atmospheric brightness temperature. The atmosphere is a gray body. It's partially translucent with an optical depth denoted by tau and an equivalent brightness temperature. If the brightness temperature is very small, then there's not very much curvature in the uh, measured um, curve of brightness temperature against zenith angle. And you get essentially the product of the optical depth and the equivalent brightness temperature, which means to determine the optical depth, you need to have an independent uh, estimate of the brightness temperature, such as a physical member, um, physical measurement of the air temperature. This tipping technique is used for monitoring a site uh, to tell you um, when it is a good time to observe, or it can be used for calibration of observations. This shows the statistics of the 225 gigahertz optical depth over 30 years measured on Mauna Kea. Uh, and it shows you the distribution, overall cumulative distribution in the lower left-hand corner with the quartiles all of the time during the night and during the day. Shows you the monthly distribution in the upper left-hand corner, the year-to-year -year variability, upper right-hand corner, and the diurnal variation day-night in the lower right-hand corner. So typically, the optical depth, the mean optical depth for observing in Mauna Kea is an optical depth of about 0.1 or 225 gigahertz. And this is equivalent to a precipitable water vapor of about two millimeters. This is a comparison of the optical depth at 225 gigahertz for three, the three sites I talked about, the South Pole, Mauna Kea, and Shanantor, which is the site of the ALMA array. Although it is convenient to use the optical depth as a proxy for water vapor, it really depends on other um, parameters as well, notably the altitude and the temperature. These are model calculations of the water vapor as a function of the optical depth. If you measure an optical depth, how much water does that correspond to? And what we see is three temperate sites, 
Sierra Cabor, which is a mountain in Chile, the Alma site, Chanantor, and Mauna Kea, all of which have a typical temperature of about 273 Kelvin. And as you go to higher altitude, a given optical depth corresponds to more water vapor. The South Pole is both a lower altitude and a much lower temperature. And there we have a given optical depth corresponding to less water vapor. Conversely, at the South Pole, a given amount of water vapor corresponds to a larger optical depth than at a temperate site. This is a comparison of the optical measured optical depth at 350 microns, about 850 gigahertz, at Mauna Kea, the South Pole, and two sites in Chile, Shanantor Plateau, where the Alma is, and Cerro Shanantor, which is a mountain nearby. And this shows as you go to higher sites, the optical depth improves more, it's better more of the time at higher drier sites than at lower sites. Going to very high altitude, this is a picture of a small test telescope that was operated for several years in Chile on a mountain, Sierra Cabor. And you see here clouds below the altitude of this telescope tracing the inversion. This is above the altitude of Alma. And this was a spectrum made with an instrument from SAO to measure the atmospheric spectrum in the terahertz band. And this indicates the atmospheric water vapor content was less than 100 micrometers of precipitable water vapor. And many, there are many windows where you could observe high frequency lines in above one terahertz frequency. The other major effect of the atmosphere is turbulence. Turbulence decorrelates the interferometer signals and reduces the visibility amplitudes. This is equivalent to convolving the astronomical image with a seeing disk. The mathematics is very analogous to the mathematics of optical seeing, but in radio astronomy, the primary cause is water vapor turbulence instead of thermal turbulence. Water vapor causes a increase in the path length through the atmosphere, corresponds to about six and a half millimeters of path length for each millimeter of precipitable water vapor. And this excess path length is pretty much non-dispersive. It's the same throughout the radio spectrum. So if you measure it at low frequencies, you can apply this measurement of the excess path length to higher frequency observations. The fluctuations in water vapor, both spatial and temporal, also cause brightness fluctuations. The water vapor is warm and is radiating, and it's fluctuating. So you get a fluctuating component to the sky temperature. And this corresponds to about 12, kilom 12 Kelvin of sky temperature for each millimeter of water vapor temperature at an observing frequency of 230 gigahertz on Mauna Kea. Even though the turbulence is caused by water vapor, the magnitude of the turbulence is actually poorly correlated with the magnitude of the transparency. The transparency measures the bulk amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. The turbulence is caused by small fractions of that bulk water vapor, typically concentrated in turbulent layers where there may be shear or other um, effects, uh, dynamic effects in the atmosphere. To show you the effect of water vapor turbulence, here's a cartoon 
of a simple interferometer with no atmosphere. An interferometer measures the delay or the phase difference between the signals arriving at two antennas. And from that phase difference and a knowledge of the baseline, one can derive the direction to the source. If we have a blob of water vapor above one of the antennas, that will add an additional delay to the signal. And it will change where we believe the source direction is. It corrupts the source direction. And if that blob of water is variable, that corruption will also be variable. And so this will scatter the incoming radiation and degrade our image. I've shown one blob of water vapor, but you can imagine an ensemble of water vapor blobs of various sizes moving across the array, moving in and out of the beams of the telescope. But the principle is the same, illustrated by one blob of water. We characterize the atmospheric turbulence by using what's called the structure function. This is the square of the phase difference measured by two locations separated by a certain distance. And so this is equivalent to the RMS phase of an interferometric observation. There are three regimes of the atmosphere that we're interested in. The first regime is what we call thick turbulence, where the separation between our two measurement points is smaller than the thickness of the layer, of the turbulent layer. And then the structure function has a power law exponent of 5 thirds. In thin turbulence, then the separation of the two points is greater than the thickness of the layer. And then that structure function has a power law exponent of two thirds. And then finally, for very long baselines, where the two points are very widely separated, then the phase at the two locations is uncorrelated and the structure function has a flat dependence on the separation between the two points. This shows you the Kolmogorov turbulence spectrum, the uh, structure function of the phase uh, for a model atmosphere that's with a layer thickness of two kilometers. And it shows the, the transition of the power law exponent from five thirds on short spacings to two thirds on long spacings. This is a model, it's presented in Thompson, Moran and Swenson's book, but it has been verified against observations. At the SMA, we have a small auxiliary interferometer that measures the atmospheric phase on several baselines by looking at television broadcast signals from satellites. And we have five stations that are mounted in the antenna support pads. So when the antenna pads are not occupied by SMA antennas, they can look at the satellite signal. And this shows the measured structure function slopes uh, for many observations. And generally, the power law exponent is between the thin and the thick regimes. It's in that mixed regime in the transition between thick and thin turbulence. This is some measurements of the magnitude of the path length fluctuations, both the diurnal fluctuation on the left and the seasonal fluctuation on the right. And it shows that at night, the turbulence is less than in the afternoon. And generally, the turbulence is less 
in the winter than in the summer. How much turbulence do we expect to see in the atmosphere? As I said, the path length, excess path length is about six and a half millimeters for each millimeter of water vapor. The phase, excess phase is two pi times the path length divided by the wavelength. So if we had 100 microns RMS path length fluctuation, that corresponds to 16 microns water vapor fluctuation and about a 30 degree phase fluctuation at 230 gigahertz. This is not terrible. It causes about 12 and percent sensitivity loss and some image degradation, but you can make good images with that kind of phase fluctuation. Anything much larger than that really starts to impact the sensitivity and the image fidelity. This amount of water vapor also leads to about two tenths of a Kelvin of brightness fluctuation. This is not so much of an issue for an interferometer, a heterodyne interferometer like the SMA, but it does become a problem for broadband instruments like bolometer arrays on single dishes and needs to be accommodated in the observing technique. With turbulence, there are some compensation possibilities. Unlike the transparency, where there's very little we can do about it except go to a better site, with turbulence, we can actually compensate for the atmospheric turbulence through different observing techniques. There are five, six of them that I've left, listed here. Self-calibration with an interferometer works very well, but it does require a bright point source. If you know that you're looking at a bright point source, then you can use that point source essentially to measure the atmospheric turbulence and subtract it. This is a, an analog of optical adaptive optics using uh, natural guide stars. But it does require a bright point source, which is not always available during our observations. Another and a technique would be to have paired antennas. Instead of having an array of antennas, have an array of twice as many antennas where each antenna is paired with another quite close to each other. One antenna can monitor a nearby calibrator to measure the atmospheric phase fluctuations, and the other antenna can measure the target source. This does work, but of course it's very expensive in terms of antenna. Antennas are very expensive, and using half of them to monitor a calibrator at any one time is an expensive proposition. Another technique is fast switching. Switching between the target source and the calibrator and back very quickly, on the order of seconds. In that time, the atmospheric turbulence has not changed very much. So the measurement of the phase on the calibrator can apl be applied to the target source to correct the phases and improve the imaging of the target source. But this requires antennas that are specially built to do this fast switching and also has an impact on observing efficiency because it consumes more observing time for calibration. Water vapor radiometers have been built to measure the amount of water vapor using the 22 or 183 gigahertz lines and particularly measure the fluctuations in the water vapor. This technique has been developed at several observatories and implemented at ALMA with some success, although there are still um, some, it doesn't always work all the time. Well, it is possible to use, to measure the continuum brightness fluctuations of the atmosphere caused by the excess water vapor. This requires a very stable receiver and has not been terribly successful so far. Another possibility is to measure the strength of the ozone lines in the atmosphere and use the autocorrelations of 
the an interferometer's correlator to measure the strength of the ozone lines and how they vary. And the variation in their strength is determined by the variation in the water vapor. Um, but this has not been well developed. Finally, a technique we're starting to investigate at the SMA is a phase screen model. Use the monitoring data from our auxiliary interferometer to measure the phase fluctuations, construct a simple model of the phase fluctuation and see if that improves the phase stability of the atmosphere of the astronomical data. So this shows an example of the success of fast switching. This is undertaken at the VLA. Uh, there are three curves here. The upper curve is switching between the source and a calibrator about every one and a half hours, every 90 minutes. The middle curve shows the effect of switching between the calibrator and the astronomical source every 300 seconds. And the lower curve is switching every 20 seconds. Now here, the baselines are very long. This is the VLA. So this is baselines of zero to 20 kilometers, uh, much longer baselines than we have at the SMA. And also the frequency is much lower, 22 gigahertz. But it does show that fast switching is able to reduce the phase fluctuations, the effective phase fluctuations in the data to much, much lower level than, than the natural level. As I said, ALMA has implemented 183 gigahertz radiometers to measure the fluctuations in the water vapor and uses that to correct the phase fluctuations. This works some of the time, but other times it provides no apparent improvement. The upper panel shows a difference between the raw data, which is the pluses, and the corrected data, which is the diamonds. And it's a reduction of the phase fluctuations by a factor of three or four, something like that. It also shows the different slopes of the structure functions on different baselines. Then. Uh, about a few weeks later, under very similar conditions, they measured another observation. Conditions, the phase fluctuations were less, even though the water vapor content was similar. And there was very little improvement through the water vapor radiometer technique. So this works some of the time, but not, other, not all of the time, and it remains a subject of research at all about how to improve this technique. Finally, the technique I mentioned for the VL for the SMA is to use the phases measured by our auxiliary interferometer, the phase monitor interferometer that looks at satellite television signals, and apply, use that to construct a model of the phase fluctuations in the atmosphere and subtract that from the astronomical data measured with the SMA to improve the image. And what this shows in the lower panel is the raw phases from the interferometer in red, from the SMA in red, and the blue is the corrected phase. And the efficiency of the observations is much improved by the correction. And then the fidelity of the image would also be much improved. This is still in progress. And these are just some experimental data. But we hope to implement this in a few in the near future. So thank you. I hope I have explained a little about the effects of the atmosphere on some millimeter observations. Thanks.